morning. Welcome to our service this morning. Glad you are able to join us in person and online, and uh, we trust that uh, you will be encouraged, you will be challenged as we sing and as we worship our God this morning. Just a few announcements from your bulletin that I want to highlight. Uh, first off is happy birthday <laughs> to Tanya, and I uh, hope you have a good day, my dear. Happy anniversary as well on the 21st to Jim and Dina Bird. Doesn't say how many, but uh, we won't go into that. Um, also upcoming, uh, March the 29th, 10 a.m., Good Friday service at Main Street Baptist Church. And then on the 31st, 9 a.m., Sunrise Breakfast. The sign-up sheet is on the table in the entryway. Um, if you haven't signed it yet, you're able to bring some stuff, then please do so as you depart our service this morning. And then 10.30 a.m. that morning will be our worship service. And just a reminder as well, March is Food Bank Month. You can bring your non-perishable food items to the facility here. And uh, if you want to give a financial gift, just talk to Pastor Paul, and uh, he will see that that all gets to where it needs to get to. The rest is there for your perusal. Please do so at your convenience. So hymn number 210, please, in your hymn books, 210, Praise to the Lord the Almighty. Let's stand as we sing. phrase where it says let the amen sound once again so it's it's okay to say amen once in a while um, we have much to pray for this morning and uh, God has been good uh, mom had her surgery on Wednesday and is recovering nicely she's doing all the exercises and she's walking around and doing well so thank you for that praying for her and just ask that you would continue to do so and we have a whole list of things, but we have to add our dear sister, Althea. Uh, she is in the hospital this morning. She went to the hospital on Wednesday. 
Um, they believe she might have ovarian cancer. Um, so pray for her and pray for Richard. Um, Althea goes down to Halifax tomorrow, and then next Monday she goes to Moncton um, for meeting with the cancer doctors and such. So be in prayer for them. Uh, God is the great physician, is he not? And he is in control, and he has us in his hand. Um, it's one of the things I love in Isaiah. It says that our names are, are graven into his hand. So he knows everything about us. He knows what's going on. He knows what's in our heart, and he is there for us. So let's bring Richard and Althea before the throne today and these days coming ahead. So let's pray, shall we? Father in heaven, again, we thank you that you are a great, awesome God. We thank you that you have created the heavens and the earth just by speaking words. And Lord, when each day was done, you said, it is good. And when everything was completed, you said, it is very good. So Lord, we just thank you that you are all powerful and mighty and that you are Elohim. And Lord, we just thank you so much for all you do for us. And Lord, it is a privilege to come before your throne of grace this morning. You tell us to come with boldness in the time of need. And that is what we're doing this morning. And first off, Lord, we bring our dear sister Althea before you this morning. We just pray that you would just touch her body, even this minute. Lord, that you would just touch her. And if it's your will to heal her physically, miraculously today, we ask that that would be done. And Lord, we also know that other times you use doctors and nurses and medications and treatments, and we praise you for that as well. So we put her, we put Richard into your hands this morning. Lord, may they feel your presence, your comfort, your strength, your encouragement. And Lord, as they take these steps that they need to take, may they continue to rely on you. And may we as your people be praying for them, being there for them. Um, helping in whatever way that we can, because that's what family does. So, Lord, we bring them before your throne of grace this morning. Lord, we also think of others who are on our list today. Lord, we think of Austin. Um, we just pray that you continue to watch over him with his MS. Um, Lord, we think of Dina with her knees. Lord, we just pray that you would intervene there. Lord, we thank you for mom for coming through surgery well. Um, her recovery is going well, and Lord, we praise you for that. And just ask that you would continue to touch her body and heal that, that knee and that leg. Um, the surgery was a little more intense than they thought as they had to replace her kneecap as well. So that might add on some, some recovery time. But Lord, we know that you are in her, or that she is in your hands. And Lord, we think of our dear friends and family at the Drew. We think of Anne Marie. Continue to watch over her and bless her father, encourage her. Bring to her memory the things that she knows about you and what she loves about you. Lord, we thank you for her faithfulness to you, to this church, to her family over the years. So Lord, just keep her healthy and safe. Lord, we think of Weldon as well. Watch over him, protect him, Lord, as he does his different daily activities. Lord, keep him free from any illness or sickness, Father. And Lord, we do pray for his salvation. Lord, that he would hear the gospel message again and that you would open his heart and he would be receptive to it. We think of Russell as well, Lord. Uh, just be with him, encourage him, and Lord, just show yourself to him also in a mighty way. We think of the staff there as well, and Lord, just protect them, keep them safe. Uh, Lord, we thank you for their faithfulness, their dedication to the, the clients there and to the work that they do in that nursing home and other nursing homes in our area. Um, we are truly blessed to have these places, Father. And Lord, we think of those who are mourning the loss of a loved one this morning. Uh, we just pray that you would just wrap your loving arms around them, that they would just feel your peace, the peace that passes all understanding, a peace that the world doesn't know. Lord, may they find comfort and strength in you this morning. So Lord, we bring them before you. And Lord, we also think of churches that are looking for pastors. There's a number of them. It seems to be more and more each and every day. Lord, we just pray that you would prepare the hearts of these men that you would have to go to these places. Um, we particularly think of Wood Point here in our area. Lord, we just pray that you would lead someone there that they could minister to and minister with, that they could reach the community there 
for um, you and the gospel. And Lord, we do thank you for the men who have been filling in the gaps in these places. Uh, godly men who faithfully proclaim your word, prepare and teach each and every week. And Lord, we just ask your blessing on them. And Lord, again, we bring before you the nation of Israel. Lord, just bless her, protect her, watch over her. Lord, we think of those on both sides of all these unrest around the world, that you would just show yourself in a mighty way. And Lord, we do know that through these unrest, people are coming to you, and we praise you for that. Continue to build your church there, and we ask that you would continue to build your church here in North America and here in New Brunswick. And Lord, we just want to see people come to know you for your honor and for your glory. So Lord, as we continue in our service this morning, may you be glorified, may you be lifted up and magnified as you are worthy. And Lord, help us to remember it's not about us, it's all about you. So we just thank you for this time, this privilege that we had of coming before you in prayer. And we look forward to seeing what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn with me to our scripture reading this morning, found in the book of Numbers. Numbers chapter 13, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Numbers chapter 13, and we'll pick it up at verse 17, and we'll go down through this passage this morning. So Numbers chapter 13, starting at verse 17. And Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan, and said unto them, Get ye up this way southward, and go up into the mountain, and see the land, what it is, and the people that dwelleth there, whether they be strong or weak, few or many, and what the land is that they dwell in, whether it be good or bad, and what cities they be that dwell in whether in tents or in strongholds. And what the land is, whether it be fat or lean, whether there be wood therein or not, and be ye of good courage, and bring the fruit of the land. Now the time was the time of the first ripe grapes. So they went up and searched the land from the wilderness of Zin unto Rehob, and men came to Hamath. And they ascended by the south and came unto Hebron, where Ammonon and Shish Shishieh and Talmai, the children of Anak, were. Now Hebron was built seven years before Zon in Egypt. And they came unto the brook of Ishkol and cut down from thence a branch with one cluster of grapes. And they bare it between two upon a staff. And they brought of the pomegranates and of the figs. And the place was called the brook Eshkol because of the cluster of grapes which the children of Israel cut down from thence. And they returned from searching of the land after 40 days. And they went up, or they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel onto the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word unto them, and unto all the congregation, and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him, and said, We came unto the land whither thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be strong, and dwell in the land, and the cities are walled, and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. And the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites and the Jezebites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went with him said, we be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they, they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land 
through which we have gone to search it, is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come to the giants, and we in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. This is the word of the Lord. Let's take a few moments and greet one another in love this morning. Right, 211 in your hymn books. Let there be praise. You can see it on the screen as well. Remain seated for this, but I will get you to stand for the next one. So be aware. You're welcome. 211. thanksgiving. Father God, we are so grateful that we can be here this morning and we are able to worship and to praise your name. And we are able to dig into your word as well and just learn about you and how awesome and wonderful you are. And Father, we give you praise this morning for your goodness to us, for your provisions of all of our needs and uh, we just want to thank you for the provision of a new instrument here in our sanctuary and um, just to be able to enhance our worship experience. And so we praise you for that. And Father, you are good to us day after day after day. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for uh, your peace that comes to us sometimes just when we need it and not before. And uh, we just thank you that you walk with us each day, and uh, we just thank you that uh, you love us so much. Thank you for watching over us. Continue to lead us and guide us as a church. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 
460 in your hymn books. 460, and we will stand for marching to Zion. Good morning. Okay, let's try that again. Good morning. Turn with me in your Bibles to Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1. Let me start by asking this question. Are you tired of being encouraged yet? Anybody? Show a hand so I can point you out. So none of us are tired of being encouraged yet because we need encouragement. When we look at around this world that we're living in, we need to be encouraged. So if we need encouragement, the Word of God is always a good place to go because it's full of encouragement. I shared this in Sunday school this morning as I was encouraging them with the judgments of God. How's that for encouragement? <laughs> but I said this, why are we studying the judgments of God? Why are we studying an Old Testament book called Joshua? And the reason is simply this, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. So whether it's the Old Testament or New Testament, whether whatever the topic is, hope or just judgment, we study it because it is inspired by God and it is profitable to us. That's why we have the Old Testament, 
so that we can learn from it. And Joshua chapter 1, as we have been seeing, is a chapter of encouragement. We know 1 Corinthians 13, it's given the title, the love chapter. So if I was going to give Joshua chapter 1 a title, it would be the encouragement chapter, because it's full of encouragement. In the first nine verses, we see God encouraging the new leader. God encouraged Joshua. He encouraged him from the moment that he gave Joshua his commission. Joshua, this is what you're going to do. And then not only did he encourage him with the, the commission, but he encouraged him with the promises that all this stuff was going to be done. We can trust in God's promises. And one that we looked at is that he will never leave us nor forsake us. And he never has, and he never will. So he received encouragement from the promises that God gave him. And then we finished off last week where God not only encouraged him from the promises, but we see that he got encouragement through the word of God. He was encouraged from God's word. And we too receive encouragement through his word. So there's one last piece of encouragement from God to his leader that I want to look at this morning before we move on to something else. So look at verse 9. Joshua chapter 1, verse 9, it says this. Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage, be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. Isn't that a great piece of encouragement? So before we look at this, let's pray. Father in heaven, again, we do thank you for your promises. We thank you for your word and the encouragement that we get from both. And Lord, we just ask this morning as we dig into your precious word, which is profitable to us, that your Holy Spirit would guide us and direct us, and we would leave this place rejoicing that we were here. We would leave this place excited because we were into your word, and we would leave this place blessed and encouraged because of your word. So speak to our hearts. Meet whatever need that we have this morning, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So what we see here in verse 9 is Joshua gets encouragement from God's commandment. God made a command, and Joshua is encour encouraged by it. The late Warren Wearsby said this once, God's commandments are still God's enablements for those who obey him by faith. Let me say that again. God's commandments are still God's enablements for those who obey him by faith. I need you to put your thinking caps on this morning because you've got to think way back, or maybe we've got to think way ahead because we're way back in Joshua. But think to the book of Luke, and do you remember what Gabriel said to Mary in Luke chapter 1, verse 37? Do you remember? This is what he said, for with God, nothing shall be impossible. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. Are these words still true today? They are. They are. They are as true today as the day they were spoken to Mary in Nazareth. I read another version that put it this way. For no word from God shall be void of power. For no word of God shall be void of power. The very word that God speaks has in it the power of fulfillment. If we would but trust and obey. So God's word is powerful. It's powerful. Joshua and the nation of Israel will see that nothing is impossible with God. 
they will also see that no word from God is void of power. And the same is true today. Do you remember that hymn we sang? And I made a comment about it. Let the amens shout again or be heard again. That would have been a place forward. Okay? I'm going to have to get a card and just flip it every once in a while. But isn't that true? Nothing is impossible with God, and no word from God is void of power. Joshua and Israel will learn that, and it applies to us today as well. What excites me about the study of this book of Joshua? In the years that it took place, many, 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 many years ago, whenever Joshua was faced with an enemy, and whenever he was tempted to be afraid, he would remember that he was a man with a divine commission, and his fear would vanish. We'll see that. He had a divine commission. Be strong and have a good courage. Be not afraid. There are times where we fear, isn't there? God is saying the same thing to us. Be strong and have a good courage. Be not afraid. For with me, nothing is impossible. And my word will not return void. There's power in his word. What else excites me about this book is that whenever things went wrong, and as we go through this book, we'll see that there are times where things went wrong. They didn't go as planned. When things went wrong and he was tempted to be dismayed, do you ever get dismayed when things don't go according to plan? What Joshua did and what we need to do is recall God's command and take courage. Take courage. Okay, our plan didn't work out. But his plans and his ways and his thoughts are higher than ours. And he's in control. So be strong. Be of a good courage. And don't be afraid. Like Moses before him, Moses was his successor or his mentor. And Samuel and David who came after him, he had a divine mandate. And that mandate was to serve the Lord and do God's will. That was the mandate. Serve the Lord and do his will. And that mandate was sufficient to carry him through. That mandate was sufficient to carry him through every situation that he would endure. And folks, we as God's people, we also have a mandate. God doesn't save us so that we could come into a beautiful facility and sit here and sing some songs and hear from the word and then go out and be on our merry way. We have a mandate. Well, what's our mandate? I'm glad you asked. Matthew chapter 28, verse 20. Here's our mandate. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So our mandate is this. Go. While we go about our everyday business, whether we're at the market, whether we're at school, whether we're at work, whether we're wherever, we are to go. And what are we to do? Teach all nations. That first teach here, because there's another one coming in the next verse, teach means 
share the gospel. Tell people that Jesus died for their sins according to the Scriptures and that He was buried and rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So we go and share the Gospel. And then it goes, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So once we go, we teach the Gospel, people will get saved, then they get baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, Teaching them to observe all things. Well, what's that second teaching? Teaching them the things that are found in the Word of God. Teach them the doctrines of the Bible. And we have this precious promise at the end, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. So we have a mandate and the Lord will carry us through as well, just like he did Joshua. He will carry us through. So here's some questions that I need us all to think about. Have we committed ourselves to this mandate of going, sharing the gospel, baptizing people, and then teaching them the things in the word of God? Have we committed ourselves to the mandate? So ask yourself that question. And I trust we can all say yes. Which leads me into the second question. Have we committed ourselves to Vision 525? And you remember what Vision 525 is? We here would like to see five people come to know Christ as their Lord and Savior and then be taught the things from God's Word before the end of 2025. So have we committed to Vision 525? And I hope we all have said yes. Which leads me to one more question. If we are committed to the mandate, and if we are committed to the vision, will we commit ourselves to this next step? And those that read the One More Thought devotionals, I sort of leaked this out a little bit last week. Will we commit to what is called Track Tuesdays? And you may be asking, well, what is Track Tuesday? Do we know what a track is? It's a little piece of paper that has a gospel message on that you can pass to someone. We have a whole bunch of them on the foyer. Do you know what Tuesday is? So when we connect the two, we have Track Tuesday, which means that we will commit to passing out one track on Tuesdays. And when we pass out that one track on Tuesday, we pray for that person that we gave that track to for one month, that the Holy Spirit would open their hearts and their minds and that they would be receptive to the gospel and put their faith and trust in Jesus. So that could mean we could be praying for three or four people at a time because if we pass out a track every Tuesday, and pray for that person for a month, and this starts a week from this Tuesday, that means on that Tuesday I'm praying for one person. On the next Tuesday I'm praying for two people, and then three, and then four, and then it goes back to three because we stopped praying for that one person at the beginning. But I would suggest if you want to keep praying for that person, keep praying. Because you can never pray for too many people to get saved. Well, what's a track going to do? Many people have come to know the Lord through reading a track. Ever hear of a fellow named Ed Seely? A tract is what started him on his salvation experience. One track that someone crumpled up and he picked up and read. And then eventually by the side of his son's bed, 
he gave his life to the Lord Jesus. And the Lord has used him in mighty ways. He is committed to the mandates of going and baptizing and teaching. So have we committed to the mandates? Have we committed to Vision 525? And will we commit to Track Tuesday? He will see us through. He will see us through and he tells us not to fear or be discouraged. Because I'm with you every step of the way right till the end. Isn't that awesome? That's awesome. So Joshua was to take the word of God in one hand and the sword in the other. He's to move out in faith. And folks, we, like Joshua, need to be strong and courageous and not fear because we are in enemy territory. So be strong and courageous. We are to obey God and leave the results or the consequences with him. I believe it was Charles Stanley that used to say that all the time. Obey God and leave the results and consequences with him. So in these first nine verses, we see God encouraging his leader. So let's move on, shall we? I'll take a drink so that can keep me going for another 45. Did you ever hear of the pastor that said, I'm going to put uh, candy in my mouth, and when the candy's gone, I'll stop preaching. So he pops in his mouth, and he's preaching, and he's preaching, and he's preaching, and he's preaching, and then he took the candy out of his mouth and realized it was a button. <laughs> so don't worry, I'll wrap this up eventually. I'm on page two of seven. So let's look at verses 10 to 15, and we'll see that the leader that was encouraged by God is now a leader who encourages the officers of the people. So in Joshua 1, starting at verse 10, then Joshua commanded the officers of the people, saying, Pass through the host and command the people, saying, Prepare ye vigils. food. For within three days you shall pass over this Jordan to go into possess the land which the Lord your God giveth you to possess. And to the Reubenites and to the Gadites and to half of the tribe of Manasseh spake Joshua saying, Remember the word which Moses the servant of the Lord commanded you saying, The Lord your God hath given you rest and have given you this land. Your wives, your little ones, and your cattle shall remain in the land which Moses gave you on this side, Jordan. But ye shall pass before your brethren armed, all the mighty men of valor, and help them. Until the Lord hath given you your brethren rest, as he has given you. And they also have possessed the land which the Lord your God giveth them. Then you shall return unto the land of your possession and enjoy it, which Moses, the Lord's servant, gave you on this side, Jordan, toward the sun rising. So here we'll see that Joshua encourages the officers of the people. From looking into Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 15, which says, So I took the chief of your tribes, wise men, and known and made them head over you, captains over thousands, and captains over hundreds, and captains over fifties, and captains over tens, and officers among your tribes. So the nation of Israel was well organized. It was well organized. So organized that Moses could quickly communicate with the people through these officers 
that form the chain of command. So if Moses had something to say, instead of going to the millions of the Israelites, he would go to these officers and tell them what they had to tell the people, and they would go and tell whatever section that they were in control of. And when Moses gathered these people together, these officers, most of the time he didn't gather them to get their advice on something. He would gather them to tell them what God had said to him so that they could go and tell the people what God said. God's will was clear. The nation had to be ready to obey. About 40 years before, in the passage which we read in Numbers this morning, at a place called Kadesh Barnea, the nation knew what the will of God was. Go into the land, scout it out, and then take it. That was God's will. But they refused to do it. They refused to obey God's will. Why? Because they listened to the ten spies that went and spied on Canaan instead of believing the commandment of God and obeying him. You know, twelve spies went and spied on Canaan. And the little kid's song says, ten were bad and two were good. And we've seen the description of the land. They described it as a land flowing with milk and honey. The grape clusters were so big that they put it on a stick and two guys had to carry it. Go to Independence and buy a bag of grapes that size. I bet you none of us could afford it. So when they were there, it seemed like, oh, this is pretty good land. But when they got back to tell the report, the ten spies said, oh, no, no, we can't do that. They're giants. And we look like grasshoppers. Well, guys, that's a little bit of an exaggeration. If you look like grasshoppers to these guys, that would mean they were about 300 feet tall. And they weren't 300 feet tall. Right? Goliath was nine feet, nine inches or something like that. That's a far cry from 300 feet. But they were afraid. And they said, no, 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 we can't do that. Had they listened to Joshua and Caleb, they would have avoided a lot of time in the wilderness because they knew God's will, they knew God's command, and they disobeyed it. Had they listened to Caleb and Joshua, they wouldn't have spent so many difficult years in the wilderness. There is a place in Christian service for godly counsel, but a committee report is no substitute to the clear command of God. And that's almost what they were getting from these ten spies. You know, the committee report. Oh, no, we, we shouldn't do that. Oh, we can't afford to do that. Oh, the task is too big at hand. That's why most of the time Moses said to these officers, this is what God said, now go tell the people. I'm not asking for your advice. But there is time for advice. There is time for counsel. Don't get me wrong on that. But when we know what God's will is, and it's plain and clear, we just need to obey. We need to obey. What we see here in verse 10, then Joshua commanded the officers of the people. Joshua took church. He didn't do it by presumption. But he did it in confidence because he just had all these wonderful encouragements from God and his promises and his word. He did it because God told him what to do. 
the word as we look into it, and if you study the Old Testament, maybe the first five, cha- or five books, the word tells us that God had told Moses that he would be with him. He told him that over and over. When Moses returned to Egypt after spending years in Midian, he was fearful. But look what God said to him in Exodus chapter 4, verse 12. Exodus chapter 4, verse 12. This is what God said to him. Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. As you remember, Moses used the excuse, well, I'm not a very good speaker, God. That's okay, just go. I'll use your mouth. I'll even give you a mouthpiece. His name is Aaron. So just go. And that's what he did. That's God's method. Disobey me. Or just obey me, not disobey me. Just obey me. And I will be with you wherever you go. When God called Jeremiah in a dark and difficult day, listen to what he said to Jeremiah in Jeremiah 119. He said, And they shall fight against thee, but they shall not prevail against thee. For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to deliver thee. They're going to come and fight against you, Jeremiah. But don't worry, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm going to deliver you. They're not going to prevail against you. I'm with you. We need the kind of of conviction and courage which is spoken in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 6. I believe we read this last week or the week before. Hebrews 13, 6 says, let's go to verse 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he had said, I will never leave thee. Remember, that's a triple negative, which means I will never, never, never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Verse 6, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. So the Lord is my helper. When David first spoke these words back in Psalm 118, verse 6, he turned his heart, he turned his mind away from the things which he has seen to the unseen. It means that he occupied his mind and his thoughts with the things of the living God. Don't fill up your mind and your thoughts with the things of this world. Fill them up with the things of the living and true God. David recognized that this special bond was a spiritual bond. It was a spiritual bond that was between him and the Lord. Therefore, he could say, the Lord is my helper. And we have that same bond today as believers. No matter what you're going through in life today, we can say, the Lord is my helper. And he will never leave me. And he will never forsake me. And he is with me. Wherever I go, he is with me. So occupy your mind with the things of the true and living God. David knew that the Lord would deliver him. Joshua believed God, and God had encouraged him to step out. Why? Because the word of God was authority in their lives. And folks, the word of God has to be our authority today 
as well. Here at Salem Baptist Church, the Word of God is the authority. And it always will be. The authority of God's Word. It was not to depart out of His mouth. He was to meditate on it. Remember what that means? To muddle. He was to be like a cow chewing its cud. He was to meditate on it. He was to do what was written in the Word. That's the formula for faith. The formula for faith. Or to be in it. To study it. To meditate on it. As the psalmist wrote in Psalm 1, we are to delight in it. Do we delight in the Word of God? Are we meditating on the Word of God day and night? Verse 11 of Joshua chapter 1. Israel's ownership of the land is unconditional. God said the land is theirs. It's theirs. Their ownership was unconditional. But Israel's possession of it was conditional. Israel had to take the land. They had to. The key word in the book of Joshua, do you remember what it is? Is it victory? No, it's not victory, because the victory is the Lord's. Possession. That's the key word. I'm going to ask you again next week. The key word is possession. Israel was to possess the land. And here we see Joshua giving this command, prepare your, your, your food. For three days you're going to go to Jordan. As I was thinking about that, wouldn't the better instruction be, okay guys, prepare your boats. We're going to cross the Jordan. Wouldn't that make more sense? Prepare your boats. We're going to cross more water. No, but he says here, prepare your food. He didn't say prepare your boats because he wasn't trying to second-guess God. He wasn't doing that at all. He knew that God had opened the Red Sea. He was there. So he knew that God would also get them across the Jordan River. So prepare your food. You're going to need it. Because in three days we're going. He and Caleb, they were present when God led them out of Egypt. They had confidence in God. They had confidence in God, and we too should have confidence in God. He has seen us through situation over and over and over again, and he will continue to do so. Though he trusted God for a miracle, Joshua still said, get your necessities ready. Get your necessities ready. Each family and clan, they had to prepare its food. According to Exodus 16, the manna was still falling every morning. It was still falling. And Jeremiah, or not Jeremiah, Joshua 5, 11 and 12, tells us that the manna would keep falling until Israel was in their land. So that's why Joshua is saying, prepare for food. Because in three days, we're going to the Jordan. We're going to start possessing the land that God has promised to us. And once we possess the land, the man is going to stop. So we're going to have to have food. And we're told in the Jeremiah or Joshua 5, 11 and 12, that they would eat the old corn of the land. 
That would be the corn that they captured from the enemy. Old corn. Ever eat old corn? Old corn. And the reason they were eating old corn was because they hadn't had a chance to grow the new corn. As you recall, they had manna that fell every day, and they had to gather it that morning. And it would feed them throughout the day. And the next morning, manna would fall. So they couldn't go out there and be like people today and gather up as much as they can, and maybe other people wouldn't get any. Because the next day, that would all be bad. You couldn't eat it. So you would gather up just what you needed for that day, and then the next day the Lord would send more. I believe that we can apply this as we look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, where we are told to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Being filled with the Holy Spirit is not a, a one-time job. It has to be daily. Just like the man of fell, they had to gather it daily. We don't go to the gas station and fill up our cars. I don't know if you're like me, but I try to get every last bit of gas into my tank that I can. The, the nozzle is almost hanging out of my car, and I'm still squirting trying to get some more in. But we don't fill up our car and say, okay, it's full. Now let's seal up the tank because I'll never have to get gas again. Anybody do that? No, that would be foolish. Because odds are we're going to have to get gas again within the next four or five days. That would be foolish. But there are many Christians today who think that they can have one experience and that's it. They never have to experience again. If we're going to walk in the Spirit and have a life where we live for Him, we need to be filled each and every day. In fact, let me ask this question. How many people fill up their physical body more than once a day. Most people three times a day. Yes? I have a friend, Gary. He's one of these weightlifter guys and all this buff stuff, bald head and everything else. When he was working at the sawmill before he went into full-time ministry, he was telling me he would eat, he would eat at least six times a day. Because he had to, because he was burning off so much energy at the mill and then all this gym stuff and everything else. But now that he's just a little old pastor, he only eats twice a day. He has two meals, and he said he has two protein shakes. So I guess that's almost four times a day, if you figure it right. But we mostly feed ourselves three times a day. So wouldn't it be a good idea to ask for the Holy Spirit's filling at least three times a day. When we get up, the afternoon maybe, supper time, control me, fill me. I think it's really important, especially after supper time, because what do most people do after supper? They snack. But most people sit down and watch TV for a couple hours, some people for 10 hours. If you're a 10 hour TV person, that's too much. So at supper time, saying, Lord, fill me with your spirit. So if I watch anything on TV tonight, let it be something that'd be honoring and pleasing to you. So help me to watch what goes in my ears and what I see and what comes out of my mouth and where I go and what I do and all that sort of stuff. So I think filling with the Holy Spirit three times a day would be awesome if we want to live for Him and walk with Him. We all need a constant filling of the Holy Spirit. 
of looking to him and arresting upon him. So it was important that the people stay strong because they were about to begin a series of battles. And as we continue on through the book of Joshua, we're going to see battle after battle as they possess the promised land. And it's important for us to stay strong as well. We need to notice something that's very important here. And don't worry, I'm on page 7, so I'm almost done. We need to notice something important here. Joshua's words to his leaders were words of faith and encouragement. Listen to what he said. You shall pass over. You shall possess the land. The Lord will give it to you. Aren't they words of encouragement and words of faith? You're going to pass over. You're going to possess the land, and the Lord will give it to you because he promised to. He promised to. Joshua made a similar speech 40 years before. But the generation of leaders back then wouldn't listen. Now that generation was dead. And a new generation was ready to believe God and conquer the land. Caleb and Joshua were the oldest men in the camp. They were the oldest men in the camp. And you know what? They were still enthusiastic about trusting God and serving the Lord. So no matter how old we get, we should be enthusiastic about trusting the Lord and serving Him. I hear some people say, and this is not a slight on anything, I can't do as much as I used to when I was younger. And that's true. But you can still trust the Lord. You can still pray. You can still do whatever the Lord calls you to do because he will enable us to do it. We just need to trust and obey. That's what we need to do. It's not a matter of age. It's a matter of faith. And faith comes by meditating on the word of God. As we've seen in Joshua 1.8. And Romans 10.17, I believe, says, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. How I thank God for the senior saints who have been part of my life and ministry over the years and have encouraged me to trust the Lord and to move forward. And very quickly, I just want to mention a couple of them. Um, Huey McDougall from Sydney. He's in glory now. But before I went to Bible school, he would take me out for lunch every week, one day a week, and would encourage me and another fella to serve the Lord, to go to Bible school, to learn as much as we can about the Lord, and then faithfully serve him and continue to trust him. Another senior saint, sorry, Ed, is Ed Seeley. He was one of uh, my teachers at MBBI, and I think I mentioned this before, a month or two into MBBI, I was ready to throw in the towel. And I went and talked to him, and he encouraged me to keep on keeping on. And he wrote me this note that I still have to this day in my office, and I refer to it quite often. Then there's a fellow in, in Yarmouth when we were pastoring there, Hartley Newell. Um, he didn't say much. He was like an Elwin, but when he said something, you would listen. And he would always say, whenever the church was doing something or making decisions, stuff like that, he would always say, we did not pray about this. So he's like, we're not making decisions today. So he was an impact. Robert Sullivan, when we went to Quebec, um, the Lord has blessed us with his ministry for eight months before he took him home. 
but he was this godly saint that made an impact in a lot of people's lives. And uh, he was the type of guy that didn't want to replace nothing until it had to be replaced. So if he could fix it, it would keep getting fixed. And our church building had the wooden frame windows. So when they looked rotten and stuff, just slap a coat of paint on them, they look almost brand new. So a couple of years into the ministry over there, we decided as a church we need to do some renovations. And windows was one. And when they pushed the windows out, they were so rotten, half the wall came with it. Because it was all rotted, because we just painted and painted and painted. But he was an influence in many people's lives and mine. My dad, my mom, my grandparents, my in-laws, have all made impacts in our life and ministry. And of course, you folks, um, your senior saints, yes, yes. And so many others have made an impact in other people's lives and have been an encouragement to them just to keep trusting God, keep trusting God, put faith in God. That's my encouragement to us today, is trust in him. He will encourage you because he says, be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid. I am with thee wherever thou goest. He's given us a mandate. Let's commit to that mandate. Father, we thank you for this time you have allowed us to be here. Thank you for speaking to us through your word this morning. And Lord, we thank you for all the encouragement that we've been getting out of this chapter. I pray that it's been a blessing to us. And as we leave this place this morning, Father, may we ponder the things that you have showed us today. And Lord, may we just simply trust and obey. As the hymn says, there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. So as we leave this place, give us traveling mercy. Give us opportunities to serve you. In Jesus' name, amen. We have one more hymn to sing. Let's stand and sing number 419.